Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to yet another episode of the Sussman Original Show. I'm your host, Joshua Sussman, and today we are joined by indie game dev extraordinaire Edmund McMillan. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say he is the uh, lead creative driving force behind the runaway indie successes, Super Meat Boy and The Binding of Isaac, both amazing games. If you haven't heard of them already or played them, check them out. And if you're familiar with Twitch and the words Blood Trail or Bible Thump bring anything to mind, well, he's a guy behind those two. He played a pretty major part in the wonderful indie game development documentary, Indie Game The Movie. And as an artist, storyteller, and game designer, I feel like he provides a pretty unique look into an industry oft represented not by its people, but by its products. So without further ado, on with the interview. Uh, hey, Edmund, thanks so much for uh, joining us, or joining me for the podcast today. No problem. Yeah, and so uh, one of the first questions I like to ask people is basically when someone asks you, you know, who you are, or what do you do, what do you, what do you say? I tend to just say I make games. It seems to be the thing that resonates the most. Sometimes I'll say I'm an artist, or I'm an independent artist, or self-employed depending on how vague i want to be <laughs> if people ask if people ask more in-depth questions because usually it's if i say i make games they say what what kind of games and i say weird games <laughs> and then they say Do you, have i played any of them and i said I, I don't know maybe and then i'll say by any of isaac and super meat boy and they'll say huh and then i'll say are you, you ever watch anybody stream stuff on twitch and they'll say yeah and i'll say you know that crying child that people put the little emoticon thing that people do in chat that's me and then <laughs> nice. they go oh I, okay yeah i've got i got it i've seen that that's it yeah well i mean it it covers quite a few bases i feel like mm -hmm. and then yeah i usually like uh, starting out the beginning but how did you originally get interested in gaming um when it came to game design i i, I always thought it was so would be so cool to make games because i was really into games as a kid but i thought it was I thought I would be useless because I wanted to do design. Like I wanted to lead and mm -hmm. direct and you know, they're not going to listen to some, it just, it seemed impossible. I didn't want to become a cog in a machine because I felt like I really wanted to do my own stuff and it, it didn't seem realistic to be independent. I didn't understand what that even meant. Um, even though I had played doom, I didn't know the story behind, you know, a few people making a game, um, it seemed impossible. So it, it wasn't something that I thought about. I thought I might be an animator um, or, you know, I was a comic artist for, for quite a while, too. So that's how I kind of started. And I thought that that's where I would stay. Um, and then I just kind of started putting my stuff online. And when I got rejected multiple times from different publishers, um, it was just everything pushed me towards I need to self-publish in order for anybody to see my work. I need to. Like I believed in what I was doing. It was entertaining to me and I wanted to put it out there for the world to see and no one else was going to get behind it or pay me to do it. So I had to do it myself. So I learned, you know, HTML and Dreamweaver and a bunch of other stuff from the back in the late 90s, early 2000s and made a website, started putting my stuff up, got a good amount of attention back then and then started working in Flash and Flash was basically interact interactive website stuff. And um, through that, I started doing animations um, got the attention of Tom Fulp from Newgrounds.com. He yeah. started promoting my work more and um, ended up working with him a little bit on some game projects, which I didn't even think of myself as, even when I was working with him and I was doing Flash games, I didn't think of myself as a game designer. Um, it, I just th thought I was making animations for the interactive animations, basically. Um, but shortly after that, I, uh, <coughs> I had um, lost my job as an animal control officer and I wanted to get back into doing art again um, and try to make some sort of living off of it. I felt like I didn't really give it give it enough of a go and kind of concede it and wanted to just get a real job. Um, mm -hmm. And I found out there's a company down just down the street from where I lived at the time called Chronic Logic, which made independent video games, which I had heard of one of them. It was called uh, Bridge Builder. It was called Pontifex, actually. Um, but all the Bridge Builder games were basically made by the same person. And uh, I interned there. Um, and I just, I was basically just volunteering my time in a bunch of different places cause I, I was doing like mascot logos and a bunch of other things for free to try to build a portfolio so I could get a job that paid. Hmm. Um, 
and they liked me enough to keep me and started paying me a few hundred bucks a month to uh, just do random art for them. And within a month or two in there, I uh, pitched an idea for my one of my first games, Gish. And it wasn't until Gish was nominated for a, an award in the IGF and I actually showed it. We showed it on the on a, like this big expo thing. And then we had a bunch of people play it that I suddenly realized, wait, I could be a game designer. And then that from then on, that was it. That yeah, was, I was, I'm going to I'm going to do this. Like there weren't that many people doing it. Um, my voice was extremely unique back then. I mean, it's unique now, but back then it was like you couldn't I couldn't be ignored because I was such a strange weirdo in this, you know, very button up, you know, uh, pop cap type environment. Yeah. And that was and, back in like 2005. Right. And so especially 2000, then. 2004. Uh, um, yeah. But yeah. And, it, and there wasn't much money in it. Um, there was no Steam. There was no Xbox Live. There was no way to you sell your you, so, you sold your games for 19.99 off of your website and people had to purchase them off of your website. Um, and like, I remember Penny Arcade, um, posted about Gish, um, and we sold 90, 93 copies that day. And it was like the record breaking. It's like, what? 93 copies. <laughs> yeah. That's Oh that's man. <laughs> um, and it was, it was so awesome. I mean, it, and it made enough for me to pay rent for two years off of, off of Gish. So mm -hmm. it, it was enough of a cushion to kind of keep going. And then from then on, it was like. Indie games kind of blew up right shortly after that. By by 2007, 2008, there was this big bubbling boom, and um, you you know Steam popped up and Xbox Live and um, Sony also had a an, a an app store, not app store, but you know an independent game store for the most part. And um, suddenly, all my peers were making millions of dollars, like Tom Fulp and a bunch of people I grew up with making these games. And I was like, ah, oh, shit, I gotta stop making sponsored Flash games and try to make something that can make me actual money. So uh, I put all my stuff together in like this little package. It was it was called uh, This is a Cry for Help. It was a collection of all of my stuff, like from comics to animations to all the games that I had made, which probably made about 30 games at that point, and um, put it out there and really tried again to promote myself um, as much as possible so I could get the attention of, of publishers. And it, wasn't, it only took a couple months, and I started getting contacted by different publishers and actually other de other developers like Cliffy Blazinski from yeah. Uh, yeah he he actually like he's like hey you looking for a contact at Microsoft and I'm like yeah and he's like I got a contact I can hook you up and I'm like cool and they're like well yeah we want to work with you on whatever it is you're working on initially it was going to be Gish or Gish 2 um, but at, around that time um, I had made a game called Meat Boy which had become my most popular flash game and um Tommy was actually working with us on Gish um, for Xbox Live, and that fell through. And then when that fell through, I was like, "Well, let's just let's just pitch Super Meat Boy as the new thing that we're going to do for Xbox Live." And they were like, "We don't, yeah, we don't care what the game is. We just want to work with you." So I'm like, "Okay, well, then we're going to do this game." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was it. And that, that was that was the beginning of my actual career career where I was making a living off of off of my work. I was probably making a living off of Flash games in 2008. But that, I mean, that bubble popped by mm -hmm. 2010 and there was no money in Flash games after that. And now it's dead. Yeah, it's crazy how quickly technology and those things can change. Because, I mean, it was what, like Newgrounds was the hub of basically all things Flash for yep. the yep. longest time. You might as well have called it Newgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it should yeah. have just been called Newgrounds because that's where everything was. It was a cool time. A lot of creative, a lot of creative people from back then are still working now and are very popular, and making good money off of that. There's a lot of significant, you know, entertainer slash artist type people from that era that are doing well now and are, you know, pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's crazy. I mean, one of the things I was curious about though, and I wanted to ask you is how you found your partners and. Because you've worked with a bunch of just amazing developers. Yeah. Um, they Basically, I tend to work with people who are fans of my work, mm -hmm. um, that know my work, know my style. Like, initially going in, and that was probably one of the reasons why I didn't think I had much of a future in video games, is because, is like, how am I going to convince somebody that my ideas are good? And I thought, well, the only way to really kind of do that sort of stuff is to just do my own stuff and kind of 
prove my worth outside of whatever, you know, games or animations or whatever else. Like, I'm just going to write and draw as much as possible. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not the greatest illustrator in the world, but I, I feel like my perspective is unique enough to um, stand out. So I've been doing a lot of animations and um, interactive comics and stuff like that on Newgrounds, and they got, they're fairly popular. And I got contacted by Calder Bradford, who um, was a programmer, and he was the one who programmed most of my games in the early days, the Badlands, which mm -hmm. was like a, a, a small series of Flash games um, and comics and stuff that I had put up. <coughs> Excuse me. No. Worries. And uh, so he was just – I found out about him because he posted an animation where he included me – like he included my face in his little animation. So I knew he was a fan of my work and it's like, I wasn't, I wasn't popular like the popular kids in Newgrounds. I was still a weirdo in the Newgrounds group, you know, like I was still an oddball that would never have like a mainstream hit, um, on Newgrounds, but Calder seemed to really like me. And, um, I, so I contacted him and I was like, well, you, you obviously, even from what, what I'd seen of his, he could program with flash and I had tried and I hated it. Um, hmm. I really did not enjoy programming. Uh, I would, yeah, I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he's like, yeah, we should make something together. And we started making a bunch of little flash games. And he was the first programmer that uh, outside of Tom Fulp, um, that I started working with. And, uh, it was just all people who were somewhat attracted to what I had made previously. And that's kind of how it, how it kind of went down. And I kind of bounced around through different people. Some, some of the people I worked with never made another game and had no interest in making another game. It was just, a one-time thing and then they went on to do something else or went to college and or had a family or you know whatever but i liked i really liked working with a bunch you get a range of people you get a range of perspectives it changes the game like you get to riff off of the person's strengths and um yeah like everybody that i've worked with i i kind of met via newgrounds or my work on newgrounds and then of course yeah like even even the people i'm working with now like like tyler and and james mm -hmm. um I, I met through Newgrounds, essentially. James, I met through my old website. Yeah, yeah, it's so, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and I, I always find it kind of interesting because you've got a rather, let's say, eclectic mix of games on, on Newgrounds. Yeah. And they, they span so many different, I guess, topics or what have you. But where did, where did some of those ideas come from? Um, just whatever I'm, that feels inspires, like inspiring at the time. Like mm. it's just, um, I mean, I could, I could cue it up and I could go down the list and tell you what I was thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> just give me a, give me a game and I'll tell you what I was thinking about. Oh man. Well, I mean, we can start with your, so was Gish your idea, your main idea or? Uh, yeah, it was, um, so Working with Alex, um, Alex was the, the lead programmer of, of Chronicologic and eventually Cryptic C. He's still mm -hmm. active now. He's a very, very good programmer. <laughs> um, his whole thing is, is physics. He's really, really, really good at physics and has a really unique perspective when it comes to it. Um, mm -hmm. He's very rigid when it comes to it as well. Like he really wants everything to be 100% physics based, no cheating. Um, you know, make a, you want it, you want the physical world because his, his dream is to make a, a physically walking humanoid that actually has balance and everything else like that. And that's what oh, he's been man. working on for ages. So when I went in, it was um, Bridge Builder and this game called um, this game called Triptych, which was like mm -hmm. Tetris with physical kind of like squishy blocks. I really loved the physics stuff. And um, I had I thought that it would be really neat to do a, a physics-based platformer where you were like a blob. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was essential. I had a whole design document with a bunch of different abilities. And I kind of pitched it to him and for whatever reason they thought yeah okay we'll do it and when he started programming it we kind of cut away a lot of abilities like he used to have like the ability to shoot out like a grappling hook whip and squirt goo places and stuff but it was just once he had the little physical ball rolling around and then some objects to interact with and we made him sticky and we made him you know hard or slick which were his three abilities it was mm -hmm. like oh we can make a whole game with this and all I need is a level editor and I can go at it. And then he built the level editor and that was it. Like we, we had a big dreams of, of having really cool interactive bosses and more enemies and stuff like that. But it's very basic looking back. Um, but it was cool. Uh, I really liked working on it and I still think it stands out as a very, very unique 
platformer. I don't, I haven't seen many like it. I think Loco Roco came out of quite a few years after mm-hmm. Gish. I remember thinking, like they had to have played Gish. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, other than that, there wasn't, there weren't that many like uh, other physics based platformers like that. Yeah, that's yeah, it's crazy. What's your design process like? I'm sure it, it changes. The- yeah. <laughs> It really depends on the game and depends on who I'm working with. Sometimes I'll get inspired by a theme and I'll really just go hard on that and like want to design around a theme as much as possible. Um, And sometimes I'll get inspired by a mechanic. Most of the time, I'd say I want to get inspired by a mechanic. Like the end is nigh wasn't a mechanic inspiration. It was literally like I want to write about a new perspective on difficulty when it comes to it maybe being stressful or a detriment um it's like it was kind of like the opposite of what super meat boy was mm-hmm. kind of offering where it was meat boy was exploring difficulty and triumph and um the end is nigh was was exploring difficulty and failure and and an uphill battle that felt so terrible <laughs> and it was you know I, I wanted to kind of quit games i was getting sick of it and i had a lot of bad experiences and legal issues and just a bunch of horrible things that had nothing to do with art and nothing to do with making games, but were just kind of like the casualty of, 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 of being successful in this industry. And I hated it. And I, and I was, and I was growing to hate the industry and growing to hate the community and didn't find no joy in what I was doing. And I wanted to make a game about it in hopes that I would have some perspective on it and maybe not feel like that. And I just just did had a baby at that point in time, and I questioned like, well, is it really even fair for me to be working as much as I have in the past? And what you know, what's the future hold? And that's what I wanted to make a game about. And it it was that it was that that inspired that whole thing, and everything in the game was tied somehow into stress, anxiety, worry, defeat, you know, just just feel depression, and mm. that's how. Game, I hope feels. I know it's not the most fun thing to play in the but, world, and yeah. it's the type of person that goes in to those themes. But I was also trying to make it, you know, an accessible and fun game mm. to play, even though it was dancing around a lot of terrible things that no one would want to really experience. But yeah, so some some games I approach that way, and some games I approach mechanically. Yeah, I, um, I, yeah. I feel like that's a side that's not talked about as much when it comes to games and game development is the the artistic side or almost like the therapeutic uh, aspect of it yeah uh, it's funny too because a lot of old games that's what it was about like um what was that missile missile command yeah yeah that was all about the guys the guy being paranoid about being bombed by russia hmm. in the cold war like and he wanted to talk about how it would never stop like the, the waves keep coming and it just gets harder and harder. And, it, you know, there's, it doesn't take much to inspire something and make it personal and unique. Like even, and I'm sure they'd never talk about it too, but you look at a game like Mario and you're thinking like, well, someone's doing drugs here and this is clearly drug references <laughs> in here. And, <laughs> but, or it could just be, he's really into Alice in Wonderland, but no one's talking about it. There, there's just, there's always usually something behind something significant and i think Mm -hmm. people can like kind of feel it and you know when something is void of it too which is why i think a lot of really mainstream games that even though they make a lot of money they end up you end up feeling a little empty and they don't make an impact they they are kind of void of of something Mm -hmm. something unique or personal which is why i think indie games are so successful these days is because it's almost impossible to not put something personal um in the game when you're making it especially when it's only like two or three people. Yeah. Do you, do you ever feel like your games get misunderstood? No, I don't care. Um, mm. um yeah, of course they do. Like, yeah. but it's not, a, it's not, it's not, um, I don't make them like quite, I'm making them. If when I'm writing about something personal and I'm putting it in a game, I'm writing to myself. It's kind mm. of like a diary. Like I'm writing to myself and then it's kind of like I get to leave that diary on a bus stop and someone's going to pick it up and read it and then post about it online. And then I can get a perspective of what somebody else thinks about the experience that I had. And so for me, that's what I'm getting out of it outside of purging it, you know, outside Mm -hmm. of it feeling like I'm letting go of it. I'm getting it. I'm getting, 
I'm, I'm letting it go. It's coming out of me. I, I, I don't have to worry about it anymore, but there's also, it, it's therapeutic in a way. I guess it feels like almost going to a therapist and being like, what do you think about this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Their opinions on what they think, but it's not, a, it's not a right or wrong situation. And I don't, I don't really care. Like, honestly, all I care about when I make something is if somebody thinks, oh, that's weird. Because yeah. even, even just saying that's weird is saying unique. That's unique. That yeah. was a unique experience. That was an odd, unique experience. And I think there's, there's more weight in something like that than a lot of people, uh, give credit, give, give it credit for. Mm -hmm. because really having something unique and weird is a huge, huge compliment and it will stay with the person. When you experience something that's fun, sometimes it doesn't always stay, but if it feels unique, it, it's like, it's like going to, going to a carnival. I've been to, I've been to carnivals a million times over, but I clearly remember the one where the carny constantly talked about that. I had my nose broken and was constantly saying weird shit. He was drunk, yeah. had a broken arm and, and, and like that stands out to me because it was so odd. The experience was so Bizarre. not traditional. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm trying to offer. Like that, that, that is, that is what I have to offer quite honestly. Like I'm a pretty good designer. I'm an okay illustrator. I'm a pretty good storyteller. Um, but it's my perspective is what it's, it's the weirdness of my perspective mm -hmm. is what I actually have to offer. That's the real value that I, that I present and, that's the one thing you can go home with when it comes to playing any of my games. You're mm. at the very least going to experience something that's not like something else. And I mean, it, it completely shines through with your art and are there, uh, what are, I guess, some of the biggest examples in media that you've, that have stuck with you in terms of that kind of weirdness? <clears throat> um, a, a really big one would be the toxic Avenger. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I watched it when I was far too young. My mom had no idea what was going on. I rented it when I was five or six. And, oh, even watching that now, it's, like, pretty hardcore. And I was so young at the time. And it stuck with me because it was the most oddly naughty but weird and sadistic thing. And I watched it multiple times growing up. And now it's, you know, become one of my favorites. And there's something about that movie that just is so raw and in honest in a very funny way like it doesn't take itself too seriously but it's saying a, f a lot of stuff about society and it it just uh, it definitely opened something up in me hmm. and uh that that was a very significant one for sure um and then there's other there's other little things too just like like there was a show called fish masters which was like a local bay area show in the in the 90s and um it was on at one in the morning and it was uh, these two guys they don't actually really ever fish, but they're, they're like, it's a parody of a fishing show. It's on late night and it was so unique and so strange. And I was obsessed with it. And I feel the same way about music too. Like being really into like Nirvana and, and stuff like that when I was young, it's like a bunch of artists that have something unique to say and have a unique perspective on the world. And even though I may not share that perspective, it just feels intimate Mm -hmm. in a in a way that it's hard to explain in a way that i feel like art should be um so there's yeah there's been a lot of stuff that's just kind of stuck with me through the years and made me feel like i want to do that like i want to do whatever i'm going to do i want to do something like that like something that's saying something and speaking to somebody even though it's if it's not everybody yeah, and that's one uh, uh, way that I guess indie games nowadays have really had the chance to shine to be able to have individuals and voices. And, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I hope we don't get away from that because I know that like, I mean, I, that's what I'm in it for. Like, I'm, I mean, of course, I'm in it for fun games. Like, mm -hmm. like it's hard to argue argue that Baba is you is saying something significant about anything. But maybe it is saying something about the designer's perspective on life and their personality. It's so unique. It's so different than anything else. And it was so good. Mm -hmm. And there's just like, yeah, I, I, I want that as much as possible. Not when it comes to games, too. Like, I want it with music and I want it with movies and I want it with any kind of expression. Like, I'm, art is super important. And it's, um, I actually feel like it's devalued in a lot of ways, especially with 
how things are kind of going now online and stuff, people just kind of are stuck into <clears throat> social media type echo chamber and p politics and whatever else. And it's, it's, um, I wish there was more art being made unless mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's a, it's a sticky situation because you put money with art, you put business with art and it. It's impossible to make it less. I mean, not to not make it less that of, of, of an artistic piece. It's just, it's the way it works, but you can walk that line and make something cool still, but it's hard not to think about it. Yeah. And it's hard not to be influenced by, which I guess the ma the masses or by what yeah. seems to be popular for sure. And yeah. It's, it's, it's a messy situation. Um, and you know, I'm, I try not to, but of course I'm somewhat guilty of all that too. Like I, I, I want my games to succeed. Like one of the questions people ask, um, with Bumbo, um, the legend of Bumbo the game I'm working on currently, and it's a prequel to the binding of Isaac. And they're like, well, why would you, are you just doing a prequel to binding of Isaac? Because, you know, that's your, your big game. And it's like, well, yeah, um, of course that's a factor in this. Like I want, I want you to play it. Um, and how, <clears throat> how am I going to get people to play it? Like it's, it's kind of like that. And, and maybe I could have made it with James and made it different. Like maybe I could have made it a completely new IP and whatever else, but going in, it was kind of like, a like I, I, I went in knowing, okay, the whole thing comes from it, which is funny ages ago um tommy was half jokingly saying that i could put the binding of isaac on anything and it would become a success <laughs> and and i was like well maybe i should do that with Bumbo. <laughs> and, and after thinking about it it made me think like well i what kind of story could i actually tell if i made a prequel to the binding of isaac um what kind of mechanics can i re-envision with a puzzle game when it comes to the binding of isaac can i like take the Binding of Isaac and turn it into a puzzle game, which is funny because then about a year and a half after making um, or starting on The Legend of Bumbo, I made made Four Souls, which was a card game based on The Binding of Isaac. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it's kind of fun to like deconstruct and put back together like mechanics that are that you're very proud of or themes that you're very proud of. And um, with Bumbo, it it the 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 story of Bumbo and no one will know what I'm talking about until you beat the game, which maybe not everybody will do, but is is so significant and so important and so personal and so unique. I really dig it, and it makes the whole thing make sense. Um, but there's of course the barrier of beating it <laughs> just yeah. to know what I'm talking about. But um, it it's very appropriate, and a lot of people probably won't see that going in, but it's a very appropriate prequel to The Binding of Isaac on many levels, mm. and I'm super proud of it. But, of course, making it a prequel to The Binding of Isaac was a decision that I made initially because it was like, well, how can I make sure that this game gets a lot of attention? And, um, you know, just got to be honest with that. Of course, it's a factor in what I do, but... I do sometimes think to myself, like the, the thing that gets me is usually when like I want to do something or I want to say something and I think, well, what will the Internet have to say about this? Am I going to be dogpiled on? Am I going to be hated on? Am I like what's going to happen here? Um, and I try my best to ignore that and just, you know, be as respectful as possible, but say something, you know, and, and, and just deal with it. And uh, so I, I try to stay true to my vision and not budge from that sort of stuff. But I think for the most part, people get that. Like I've, I've made a lot of controversial things over the years and I don't get much shit. So I've, I, you know, I've, I've been accused of many different things. I've been, been accused of being a misogynist. Uh, I probably somebody called me a racist at some point. I don't know. But. <laughs> yeah. I've probably, probably every name in the book at, at some point, but uh... yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't care. I, I was yeah. honestly worried. Like with the Binding of Isaac, I was worried about the backlash from the. the yeah, bar. I was gonna ask, how was that for like? It was not. There was nothing. Yeah. But it was like, it even sounds crazy now because, looking back, when when I was doing it, I I thought I was making, I thought I was making a very harsh commentary, like very harsh, mm -hmm. and it was so honest and true to my experience, and I thought, oh man, like this is gonna this is gonna upset some people and. My wife, I, I shared it with my wife and she's like, 
yeah, she was worried. And she told me afterwards she was really worried. He was like, usually the people that you don't – back then at least, I guess times have changed. But the people that you don't want to upset the most would be like the Christian right. Mm-hmm. Like those are the people who really go crazy. Uh, things have changed though, so you don't have to really worry that much about them yeah. anymore. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, a lot, a lot has changed and then absolutely nobody cared. And I got a surprising amount of people who were Christian who were really into the game simply because it was based on a biblical story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even, even my dad, who is a pastor, um, he, he loves the game and he installed it on a bunch of the computers for like one of, one of their lock-ins for like oh, the man. weekend. Yeah. And yeah, so it's like, and I even told him like, but you know, maybe we, you know, dad, I don't know if it's really appropriate for, <laughs> for but, your the lock-in. And, he, and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, it's kind of like, it's kind of harsh. And, and it's a bit of a commentary on, you know, how Christianity could really fuck with somebody's head if they feel like they're an outcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, well, but it's, but it's true to the Bible. And it has, and he's like, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that's the beauty of having different perspective on things. Like people don't need to play the binding of Isaac and, and worry about any of those themes for the most part. They just see a strange story and a fun game. Yeah. And, then they and an just incredibly fun it. one at that. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy though. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever replay any of your games? Oh yeah. 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 For sure. I usually, um, usually on the one year anniversary of whatever game or period, just, at the anniversary of a game, I usually pick it back up and I'll play through it again to make sure. With Isaac, it's a hard one because my wife plays it a lot still. Oh, nice. And yeah. So I, I watch more than I play. Um, but I'm sure, I'll, you know, I, I, I do play, of course, to test. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard to say. But yeah, like I play through the end is nigh on the anniversary of that. Um, and I tend to kind of do the same thing for some of my older games. Yeah, that's... But, that's cool. I'm actually, that surprises me because you always hear with like professional mu- musicians who spend so much time listening to their same song over and over that they just avoid it like the plague. But... Well, I want to know, like I, I, I'm a very, um, I'm very critical on myself and my work and I want to go back and see what worked and what didn't, um, you know, see what aged well and what didn't, that sort of stuff too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Do you... One thing that I've always wondered about, uh, especially with games like The Binding of Isaac and C- Super Meat Boy to a certain degree, but do you ever like watch YouTube videos of people who are trying to abuse glitches or trying to find crazy combos? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, in, since I'm pretty active on Twitter, people will show me that stuff, too. So it's easy for me to have access to it. But yeah, I love that stuff. I mean, I love all that stuff. I really like I really like when people get creative with my games and make art and whatever mm-hmm. else. I actually have a big collection of handmade like sculptures and felt things and whatever else people want to send me. I have a huge collection of that. And I of course retweet whatever people make and stuff like that too. But even when it comes to playing and, um, I definitely, when I release a game, I tend to watch let's players for the first week, Mm -hmm. just watch, watch people experience it because I want to, it's a really cool thing to have because for, for ages I was making games and just crossing my fingers. And then the only information I would get would be from reviews you know, and you don't get to see the face of the person. Like you don't get to see them enjoy it. And with the end is nigh, that was one of the more recent ones. Cause you know, I think, well, when I initially released the release of binding of Isaac, there was a few let's players that would, that were active and would Mm -hmm. play it. But even then they weren't showing their faces. It wasn't cool to put your, you know, your webcam up. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And uh, so you didn't get to really see it. But then with, with the end is nigh, when that came out and we were watching people beat it, that was really cool. And you get to see people like really just tense situations and and lose their minds on on, on stream was super neat. So I do do that. I went on release. I, I'll usually do that. But like how many more Let's Plays of The Binding of Isaac can I watch? Yeah. Have you, <laughs> yeah. Have you uh, noticed any impact that things like Twitch live streaming have had on indie games in general? Uh, it's really difficult to say because like, I want to say logically let's players of course help immensely, mm-hmm. but the numbers don't show. Hmm. Uh, it's really hard to kind of see. Like I remember there were a couple of times, um, a few years back where PewDiePie actually <laughs> played the binding of Isaac. Okay. And I remember thinking like, Oh the shit. PewDiePie this is effect. Gonna, 
yeah, this is going to be nuts. And it did not affect sales at all. Huh. Um, and so it was very hard to like nail it down. But you'd think that either way, it's like someone playing something is basically a mini ad for the game. Um, and as long as it's not a story driven game that's spoiling every aspect of the game as you play and making it irrelevant for you to play yourself. I mean, it's not going to affect my games because my games are usually gameplay based and like it, it, the experience is going to be different each time you play. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in the, you know, it's not in the cutscenes. It's in, it's in the gameplay. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it's got a, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really, I really don't know. It's, it's kind of funny because whenever, like even my, um, my friends and uh, uh, my nephews and nieces and stuff like they're, they're less into playing games and they're more into watching games played. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be a thing. And they, th there was a pocket of time where I, I remember a lot of people coming up to me and being like, Oh yeah, my kid really wants to make, makes video games. Um, and you make video games. That's so cool. And that's what they want to do. That's their dream job. And then within three or four years of that, it was, yeah, my kid wants to be a streamer. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> my kid, my kid wants to be the next ninja, you know, that sort of thing. Like, yeah. uh, and, um, so yeah, <laughs> it's it's a whole other it's a whole other world. I try not to be like an old person and and say I don't I don't I don't get this new <laughs> play, let's play stuff, but I also know I'm I'm close enough to a bunch of streamers to know that it's fucking hard work. It's ridiculously hard work and can be very it's it it mirrors game development in that same isolating way. Like you are interacting with people socially and i think there's something in your brain that's like yes i am interacting with people socially and i'm doing this and that but really you're not getting any of the chemicals that your brain would be releasing if it was actual people in front of you mm -hmm. and and then they just get in these like depression pockets and then they just start hating everything they're doing and i could i i i, I, I tip my hat to people who do that because it's i'm not built for that that's for sure i'd be one of those people that would rage the fuck out and say i hate all of you people fuck you i'm doing whatever i want to do i want to play whatever i want to play and i'm out of here like it's not gonna i can't i could not do it um so i'm glad i'm doing this instead <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's cool and it's uh yeah it's really interesting how much of an impact i would say like especially the, the indie game scene has had on people wanting to become game developers and game designers. Do you have any tips or, uh, for people who, cause that's, that seems like it's always the number one, you know, thing is I want to make video games, but I don't really know how to program. Yeah. <laughs> so what, um, yeah. Yeah. So what I usually, and the most honest thing to say, depending on the age of the person, if you want to make games and you're 25 years old, you're never going to make independent video games because you would have already been making games. Um, if you're a young kid and you want to make games, I would say pick up game maker or something basic and start making games. Just look up stuff online and just go for it. Just start making stuff. If you have no access to that, start making card games, start making physical, just get into the design of it and start having fun with it. And if you can't do any of that and you're just an artist or whatever, then start making comics and drawing pictures or whatever else. Start 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 building who you are as an artist so you can be significant or learn multiple, you know, you got to wear a lot of hats when you're independent if you want to be independent. But you need to just, the number one thing is you need, everybody I know that is independent was exactly like me growing up. They were, had their own projects that they were doing, multiple projects, they were their own things and they do them by themselves. And they were very self-motivated and you have to be self-motivated in order to become an independent developer. And that's the truth. It's not for everybody. Um, and that's, it's, it's, there's no shame in that. You can yeah. still make games, but I would highly recommend you make games with a company. So you're supported and you don't run yourself into the ground. Like many, many people have, like it, it still pains me to this day to have people stop me on the street and say, I saw any game, the movie, and I quit my job at EA to become independent. It's like, Whoa, Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> that is a role. That is a roll of the dice guy. Like that's not, not what I'm talking about. You know, like that's, it's just, there's a certain personality type that works well in this environment. Mm -hmm. And even if you're that certain personality type, you're going to also be very susceptible to depression, isolation, and just feeling terrible and maybe even not releasing stuff like i've worked with lots of people and, and there were lots of games that never came out because the people that i work with couldn't 
do it. Like it just wasn't going to happen. And it's, it's a very difficult job, much like streaming. It's, it's super, it can feel so isolating and so depressing at times and so uncertain and such an uphill battle. It's, um, I'm, I'm always so envious when it comes to musicians because a musician can sit down and literally write a song in a day and play it in front of an audience and they can, you can get that instant feedback and you mm. can feel that, that sense of accomplishment for doing it. Boom. Right there. Um, a game designer sits fucking alone in his room for two years. No one sees shit. And then they just hope and pray everything's good. Like, and hopefully it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's so it's, crazy. It's, it's yeah. such a roll of the dice. How do you stay sharp during that time or healthy mentally? You don't. Um, it's, um, it's definitely, uh, yeah. Like looking back, I don't know how I maintained a relationship. Hmm. Um, because it's very easy. I think especially as a guy too, like feeling like I need to work myself to death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like oh. I'm not a man unless I'm working in an unhealthy environment. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm not sleeping and I'm not, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I got too and, much sleep. I got to work harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 uh, it sucks, but, but it's also something that's needed, uh, to some degree in this. And it's, 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 it, I feel bad to even say like you, you may have to live unhealthy. Like I don't want anybody to live unhealthy to do whatever. But the thing is, is I'm just talking from my perspective. And if I wasn't making art for a living, I would probably not be alive. Like I need to do this. Mm -hmm. This is what I need to do. And there's a lot of bad shit that comes along with it. And I try my best to balance that as much as possible. Um, and it, for me, it's as simple as eating as well as I possibly can getting exercise when I can get it, spending time with my wife and now my, my child as much as I possibly can and trying to be as healthy with my choices as possible. But I'm where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. When I, when I was starting out, it was just, I'm going hard. Like I, I would, there was a pocket of time where I would work seven hours at the office with Alex on projects that we're working on there. I'd come home, eat dinner with my wife, then I'd go back to work and I would stay up working and probably get six hours of sleep, stay up working on my own personal pro projects. And I did that for years. And it's just like, and the terrible thing too is on the weekend work, I, you know, I, I got, I got to make time so we can go and do fun stuff together and we can be close. And a whole time in my head, I'm just thinking about the shit I'm working on. Like I'm just working in my head and it was terrible. Like, but she put up with it. And, uh, <laughs> she's yeah. still around, but that's, that's kind of how it goes. Like it's, uh, it's just, it can, it's all consuming. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate to think about the, the, the people who do go in and end up not releasing something or having something come out and not actually be remotely worth their time. Um, which is why, and I'll loop this back to the initial question, which is why my, my, my number one thing when I, when people ask me, like, I want to be a game designer, what should I do? Make a lot of little games. Do mm -hmm. not make a big game. I, you should be making at least 15 prototypes before you start making something big. Like, make a bunch of little things. And it also is really helpful to do because if you make a bunch of little prototypes that have cool and unique mechanics to them or say something unique or whatever else, you could look and easily see which one of those things is the most inspiring and the most expandable and the most unique, or you could even pick and choose from different ones. And then you can work on the larger project. It's not going to be the, you should not work on it for more than two years. Um, but it's not going to be the end all be all, but you're going to work on something and maybe it'll make some money. Um, but the, the point is to learn, learn as much as possible, you know, get experience in just making stuff, you know, with yourself or one or two people. Um, you just get your feet in the water. It's it's a building block. It's your steps to stepping stones to something bigger. Do not jump in and try to jump a wall when you're not remotely prepared because you will fail. It's a fucking guarantee. Like it, it is. Hmm. You need to start out slow and you need to make a bunch of little things. Were there any resources you relied on when you're as you were learning? Um. Whether yeah, there's like some. books or channels. Yeah, there, there was a uh, Dan Paladin who um, who is the animator for the Behemoth. He's he's a friend of mine too. He's a good guy mm -hmm. and a very very talented illustrator. 
And um, he recommended this thing called the Animator Survival Guide, which is how he learned. Like this guy, like out of nowhere, went from an okay animator artist to like, whoa, he's fucking animating amazing explosions. His yeah. like walks are amazing. Like, how is he doing this? He's like, oh, I'll just read this book. And I'm not a much of a reader, but the animator survival glide is mostly visual. It's just a visual representation of how to manipulate people's eyes, essentially, into making something look like it's in motion. And after looking through the book a few times, it just, and then practicing and practicing and practicing, that was a major resource for me where like, I, I did learn a great deal of, of just the basics of how animation works enough to just use it. Like, and again, I'm not the greatest animator in the world at all. Like I, but I know a lot of tricks that I learned from that book in order to manipulate things into making things, you know, I, I, I tend to work fast. I'm a fast worker. Mm -hmm. I'm a fast animator. I, I'm, I'm focused on the story and what I'm saying more than anything else. Like I don't want super fluid animation and whatever. Um, I just want the visuals to be apparent and have some, uh, some movement <laughs> to them. Yeah. And, um, so I do, I do what I can to like cheat essentially. And I learned I, a lot of, yeah. I learned a lot of, but that's what animation is, is cheating for the most part. It's just manipulating things to making it look like they are doing something that they're not. Mm -hmm. And that was a major resource for sure. Outside of that, um, I'm not super keen on, and I, and it, and it may just be that I'm not, I was never really, um, big on school <laughs> and that sort of learning. Like I don't learn like the average person, I, I mostly learned from experience, but I, uh, I learned a great deal from other artists from watching movies. I, that's how I learned to tell stories. I watch a lot of movies. Um, I learned how to channel emotion through words and, and for the, from songs and, you know, learned a lot about pacing and emotion from songs, you know, um, and I learned a lot about game design from board games as well as video games that I love playing. And, you know, you just, it's, I mean, maybe I'm lucky that I was inspired and really enjoyed those aspects of, of art so I could, you know, use that. Yeah. But that's what I learned from. Like, my teachers were all the people that I was admiring growing up. And um, when it came to the mechanical aspect of learning how to animate or, you know, learning how to use light and shadow and illustration, you know, you just can look a tutorial up online at this point. Yeah. Just go to YouTube and in that I guarantee you will have your answer. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's crazy though. And I'm, I'm always curious just to learn more about behind the scenes and how some of these things work. So I'll definitely check that book out. The it's animator cool. survival guide. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's, that's so cool though. And then one thing I was also curious about was, uh, is there like a, the room of video games for you? Like something that's so bad, it's it's kind of good. Um, no. Um, I've played a lot of bad games, and they're hard to appreciate in the same way as a movie. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's difficult, too, because like the room isn't actually bad in a... It functions. So, like, you'd... A room like movie would have to be a game that functioned well. Mm -hmm. it, it it made perfect sense. It played well, et cetera, et cetera. But the perspective and the story and the characters and the way that things are pre presented would be like an outsider type artist that, that was like an alien to this to this world, and they like didn't understand how things worked, and they were very open to express themselves and then everybody else working on the project back to that, which is going to never happen for the most part. Um, you know, uh, so I've never really seen it because usually bad games suck and they're not playable. Like you go, go back and look at a hundred plus NES games that were just knockoffs of different games. Those games are boring to play. They're not funny. It's, there's nothing funny about how bad they are. It's not, it does not read in the same way. And I think, Maybe it's a misconception of bad movies too, because nobody likes an actually bad movie. Like, yeah. a bad bad movies are forgotten, and no one wants to talk about them. Like, the bad movies that people enjoy, which I really enjoy, are the ones that are being told by somebody's unique perspective on the world. Essentially, it's art. It's basically all I've described. Like, Tommy Wiseau, which is funny because I'm looking at a picture of him as as we're talking right here on Twitter because I follow him, um, and he looks haggard as hell. And. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tommy Wiesel is an artist and 
it probably will never happen again because he already understands now, you know, he's in on the joke, but what the room was, was him being an artist to the best of his ability, even though he wasn't a storyteller, he couldn't tell the story. He couldn't write a character. He couldn't write dialogue. He could barely speak English, but he was passionate about what he was working on and he had a very skewed but unique perspective on the world and he was showing everybody that. And it was so alien and so weird and you know his skill level was so inept when it came to writing and stuff like that but he was still allowed because he had creative control. It came out the way it did. And there's a lot of movies that are like that and it's just kind of funny like people consider it a bad movie when it's it's really not. It's 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 a it's a very fun movie. Um it's just it's just broken it's broken in a lot of different ways but it's broken in the same way that something like you could watch a movie like mandy and you could say uh wow this this the, the perspective of this person is so odd and the things that they like is so are so odd it functions perfectly but it's so strange like i'd say a lot of people a lot of mainstream people would watch that movie and think it was a bad movie but i mean to me it's a beautiful mu movie and i think a lot of uh, a lot of bad movies are like that too but that's why i think video games you're going to have a really hard time finding a bad, good, so bad it's good type video game because the key elements of of what makes a game a game, once they're bad, it's not playable. It's just not. Mm, um, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I, <laughs> but I mean, I like I remember trying to play through Deadly Premonition, I think it's called, which is, uh -huh. I think is a lot of people. But and. I could say in more story driven type games like that, that have just weird dialogue or bad translations or whatever else they could be, they could be funny and unique. Like there could definitely, there's a lot of Japanese games or even arcade games and stuff out there that are, that are uh, badly translated or have really odd Japanese themes in them that would probably read as bad, but mm -hmm. functional. So they're fun in that way, but I don't know. I guess it just depends on the definition of bad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't thought about it in that way. That's that's pretty cool. And I think too much of these things. I watch <laughs> a lot of movies. a lot of oh no, it's good though. I don't know. I feel like you can take uh, especially you can take inspiration from anywhere. You never know how. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's yeah. I'm walking the line of pretension by talking about outsider artists in, in bad movies, but that's the fucking truth. Like all the major bad movies out there, the ones that really stand out all come from the perspective of one person who's a weirdo and they had a bunch of creative control and they may not have been the most skilled at the art, but the movie functions and go, you know, start, finish and end and it's filmed and it's framed. Like no one's going to watch a movie where the boom is always in this shot and you know, the, the sets crumbling in the background. Like no one wants that. It's like, it has to still look like a movie and function like a movie. The key to it is the story, the dialogue and the acting. And if you got one person pulling those strings and that person is very off, you basically got an outsider art type experience there that, that is, can be very awesome. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, it, yeah, it's a matter of perspective. Like, uh, yeah, just someone's perspective on any, any piece of art can just trans be rather transformative. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so great. And I, I know you got to run pretty soon. But uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining, uh, jumping in. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and then, oh, one thing I did want to ask, actually, about The Legend of Bumbo, though, was that uh, did you run into any major, like, gameplay challenges designing that? Because it's a very different style. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I'd say The Legend of Bumbo is one of the most challenging design, pro design wise for me because I was going into a new genre. Um, I had never done a puzzle game like that and i feel like I, I felt like i understood how it worked but there was a lot of um it was definitely one that through development i had a very clear vision of what i thought would work and it it did work but not in the way i wanted i could say for the first couple years of development i was uncertain if it was going to work um and it wasn't until just a few months ago where i was like okay this is a good game now like i can i can it did work. I'm, I'm so glad <laughs> once all the pieces fell together, like it did function and it did work. But when it comes to development of Bumbo, this was probably the only game that I think that I've ever done where I made a lot of content for it. And then 
in the end, once it all was functioning as, as intended, I kind of looked back and I was like, oh shit, we, we don't need any of that. Like this can be completely cut away. Like it was more, I had an idea of what this game wanted and I was wrong and it Hmm. doesn't want that. It wants, it wants this, which was funny too, because it, it around that time, a, a few months back, um, uh, dicey dungeons had come out mm-hmm. and it's it's uh i'm glad it came out because it's much easier for me to say hey have you ever played dicey dungeons it's kind of like that instead of saying puzzle quest or whatever else because a lot of people have, don't know what that is and uh i was playing through it and, and as i was chopping things away from from bumbo i am i'm playing dicey dungeons and going like oh my god that's exactly what they did they streamlined it and they just completely removed so many aspects of that game and with Bumbo, it's just trimming. It was a lot of trimming the fat down to what makes this game fun, what makes it exciting, and um, I'm super happy with it now. But that it was um, it was a, a difficult dev cycle, hmm. um, especially for for James who who was doing. Uh, usually, I just do all the art myself, and this time I did all the two dimensional art. But the game's in 3D, even though it's flat 3D, it's cardboard 3D but it still needs to be modeled. So he had to do yeah. all the modeling and the modeling animation as well as all the programming. So he had a lot, it's a, it was a big workload for him and there was not much I could do um, outside of hiring extra help, which I was able to hire some, but um, he really wanted to do it. So he did it. And uh, now we're closing. We got five weeks left and uh, we're starting, we're starting testing right now with, uh, with a bunch of uh, friends of mine and other developers we're tuning it, we're tweaking it, and all that's left is just cut scenes and uh, sound effects and a few items. And I'm quite happy with it, though. It's great. Yeah, that's so awesome. That's what. Uh, what were the major inspirations behind it? Because like with Binding of Isaac, you can see Legend of Zelda. Pretty yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and number one would be Puzzle Quest, mm-hmm. um, which was the only kind of it was a match three uh, with abilities, and that's what I wanted to do. And then from there, it turned into more of um, of a draft game where you kind of have a, a, a deck of spells that, that at your disposal. And as you play, you get your choice between a few different types of spells. So you draft around an archetype um, or what works for your character. Um, and then it became so and it's it's and then it's also there's a lot of Binding of Isaac themes. So there's a lot of items with unique abilities, um, a lot of trinkets with passive abilities. Um, a lot of nods to the different different characters and enemies and stuff in Isaac. Um, and then you've got this turn-based combat system um, where enemies have movement points and different attacks and different spells, different abilities, and you have to play around them. And that's basically it. Like, I've been doing blog posts weekly, mm-hmm. uh, bi-weekly. Uh, Friday, Mondays and Fridays I do um, blog posts about it, and people are finally kind of getting it it's a difficult one to explain because i want to describe it as a is a as a match for a puzzle game but no one no one wants that you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah well you think like not, mobile or it's yeah. it's hard to be like okay well sure yeah so imagine if bejeweled was a match for and that's even hard to understand because people are like whatever if but if Ma- bejeweled was a match for game there would be a lot more strategy going on because it wouldn't just be all random chain chaining combos, right? So there's a lot less of that in this. It's a lot more strategy. And the way the puzzle works isn't just move one over, move one over. It's it's this whole sliding board so you can line up more combos that way. And outside of that, just imagine you, you're playing Bejeweled, but you have a bunch of abilities that let you manipulate the board in different ways. And then it becomes a whole other strategy. It's like it's a strategy game within a strategy game within a strategy game, and it's it's in that way it's very neat and it functions really well. It's a it's a well-oiled machine at this point, and um, there's just it, it's just fun. It's micromanagement yeah. essentially. You're you're doing a lot of thinking ahead and and planning stuff out, which isn't going to be for everybody. And I don't think every Isaac player is going to like it, but it really was a playoff of the fact that a lot of people don't realize that in Isaac. One of the things that's most appealing that people don't seem to see is the fact that they're always doing resource management stuff and they're trying to up the odds of things. And that's essentially the core of what Bumbo is. And it's all about like, okay, now if I gain a move, then I gave then then I'll gain four four yellow mana that I can use to add two more tiles to the board. What are the odds 
of adding two more bones to the board and having him make a combo within one move. And if I kill this enemy, he'll give me one move. It's it's just like it it's it's neat. Like the and best it, parts of a like a deck building game. Yeah, essentially, it's it's uh, and that's what it is. Like I can say that now because it's actually a genre that is new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to call it before, but it is. It's a it's a you have a small deck, but it mm. is a a a deck building roguelike. For sure, it's a puzzle-based deck building roguelike. Yeah. I think people will dig it. I really do. It's it's um, it's got something to offer. Yeah, it looks it looks really fun. But I'm I'm definitely excited to uh, to be checking it out. I mean, I played spent quite a bit of time in Binding of Isaac, and I was one of those people that uh, Super Meat Boy took me <laughs> two years <laughs> to beat. <laughs> The second to it last level. Years, it took me two years to make. So hey, <laughs> yeah, okay, so there's a pretty solid, you know, like, <laughs> return. Yeah. The second to last level, man, just always just kept dying. Took me forever. <laughs> but, well, do you ever play The End is Nigh? I haven't yet. It's it's on my list. I will, well, now I have to. <laughs> it's, it's much harder, much, much harder. Sweet. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's like I I I got through it pretty quickly, but uh, the the second to last level just stumped me. Yeah, but. I heard the same thing from a bunch of different people, and probably I could have probably smoothed that out. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of little rough edges with Meat Boy. It's like looking back, especially when I made the end is nigh. Of course, I played through um, Super Meat Boy, and I was like, what did I what did I do wrong here? What can I improve? And um, I felt like for the most part with the end is nigh that's I, I i did improved greatly on a bunch of different aspects but not when it comes to mainstream accessibility <laughs> who needs it i mean as dark souls has proved and and super meat yeah, boy sure. yeah that's cool have you uh i don't know that's kind of been an interesting thing that's been cycling back around is difficulty in games yeah how do you approach that as a developer when you're making Something, especially when it's something that's not supposed to be crazy difficult or whatnot. Or how much thought do you yeah. give? Um, hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, arguments about scaling difficulty and people, you know, with... I don't know. It's... Uh, I'm not a fan of difficulty settings or difficulty scaling. Um, and that's because the designs that I tend to use usually are speaking about something specific which revolve around challenge. And I do believe that everybody for the most part can handle the challenge. Um, and I'm fine with that. And the, the argument is like a lot of games, like even Celeste and stuff, allow you to scale it back. So in Meat Boy, if you, the wall that you were hitting for two years, you'd be able to scale that back and get through the game. And I can understand that. I, I totally get it. Um, and in, in, even in this conversation, it makes perfect sense why why people would do that but i don't want to do that yeah and on the other <laughs> like, hand like i did play it for two years it wasn't like yeah. i just gave up and I said don't, i don't want everybody to beat the games that i make and i don't think i'm not pause and i could be wrong here and this is coming something that i'm still thinking about but for the most part where i stand right now i don't i'm still in the group of i don't think every single person should be able to beat every single game hmm. um but and I do understand like a lot of people like especially with like Bumbo like what I was saying before like there's there's a lot going on there but you got to beat the game in order to really get the whole picture of what's happening and a lot of people aren't going to beat the game and that means a lot of people aren't going to see my vision and I don't care like I don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I mean I care more about making sure the experience is enjoyable than anything else and there's something condescending about a difficulty slider. That for me, and I'm not, you know, if you want to do that in your games, it's your fucking deal. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't care. And I don't, it, it, I'm talking about me personally. Like, me personally, it doesn't, it feels condescending to me. And I don't want to talk to my players in a way that feels like, oh, you need a little help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, it seems the, to be the opposite of what I'm presenting. Like, even the vibe of my games don't come off like, Oh, you need you need some help here. Here, let's do this. Like, it's not to say that I won't throw people a bone or make certain things easier, and or I'm just in it for for difficulty. Period. But 
I think difficulty is very appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a design choice. Yeah. And that's, that's basically it. And uh, that's a design choice that I'm making. And uh, when it comes to accessibility, you know, I try to make it accessible for people who are colorblind. But I mean, what are you going to do? Like what? Am I supposed to scale back the difficulty on the Legend of Bumbo for people who have lower than 80 IQ? Like, what am I? What am I gonna do? How, yeah. Tell me how. Like, I, there's a lot of people in the world that play video games that have a very low IQ and are very slow in general. Like, how am I supposed to make it accessible for them? It's just, I don't know. It feels like such a weird, slippery slope to mm -hmm. kind of go down. Where it's like I can't. I'd rather just say, here's what it is. It's not for everybody. You know, but I'm tr I'm trying to make it as enjoyable as I can and accessible as possible without making huge compromises. Then try to make something that works for every single person and mm. make, make make it look like I'm making compromises for my you know my own vision and whatever else I'm doing. But, yeah. but like I said, I don't know. It's not I'm not 100% on those thoughts and feelings. These are these are mostly feelings, and I don't I don't know. I don't know what's most appropriate, but I feel like what's most appropriate for me is what I'm doing. <clears throat> yeah, and it's, it's part of that just staying authentic. And yeah, is there a gameplay mechanic that drives you crazy that you find in games? Um, just bad physics on jumping. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically it. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I, I don't. I wish I played more games. I keep I'm stuck in this mode. It's almost like an Isaac mode. I play the only games I really play constantly and have played since they've come out are um, Overwatch and uh, Pokemon Go. Yeah. And, uh, I played a lot of games. I played Sp Slay the Spire. I played Dicey Dungeons. I have played um, Baba's You. You know, I really liked all those games a great deal. Um, but for the most part, I don't play as many games as many video games as I did in the past, I play more board games. Hmm. What more are some... social yeah. stuff. I play a lot of D and D and magic. Nice. Um, those are the things that I get the most enjoyment out of, but we do some party games too. Like even just the other day, my, um, my daughter turned four and during her party, there was a bunch of just, there was a lot of chaos. And, uh, um, a lot of the boys there were just kind of bored, um, because they were older and, and uh, I kind of sat down, and everybody was sitting around. And I was like, "Okay, hey, let's play Pit, that card game." Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. And uh, we played it, and they fucking loved it. And they, I don't know, there's just there's a lot there, and I and I, I have a lot of interest in in uh, physical board game stuff, which is why I did Four Souls, and yeah. I'm, I'm I've been working on some other stuff too, physical how, things. Yeah, how was that making a uh, Four Souls, which for those of you who don't know, was your Kickstarter game based off of Binding of Isaac. Yeah. Were there any major, I guess I would assume there would be some, but what were some of the major changes from making a physical game as opposed to a digital one? It was easy. Really? Yeah, it was easy and I could do it by myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a, a an amazing breath of fresh air. Um, and it came off, it came off the, you know, the, the end is nigh experience. Mm -hmm. And, I got to work with my wife and, and develop a game with her, which was had never happened. Um, the the play testing and editing phase is instant. Like you play something and it doesn't work, you literally just scribble on off whatever doesn't work and write in whatever does. Um, so and and the play testing is fun. Like I literally had a prototype that was playable within a few hours of conception, essentially. Um, and was able to play that with multiple friends and test and see how it worked. And I've done this with a few different games that I've been prototyping. Like even in the past, I was, I was working on much different card games and for fun because yeah. it was fun. Um, but it didn't seem financially viable, so I never did anything with it. But this was one of those situations where it's like, oh, well, maybe people would care and I can do something really fun and like decompile the Binding of Isaac into a card game and make it actually play kind of like how the game does. And I was super happy about that. But yeah, it was easy. It was easy. It was fun. I learned a lot from it. It was social. It made me feel good. It wasn't isolating at all because I had to like play with my friends and they all had a good time and I had a good time and it, the experience was fun. And I can't say the same for a lot of other games that I've worked on, but 
this was this was one of few one of few like really quick really fun really inspired experiences that were very genuine and my excitement during the kickstarter was 100 percent genuine i was i was digging it i was really enjoying the game and i was excited about everything we're doing yeah it's so rad yeah it, it really is i there's something interesting about i guess game making that i don't know a, appeals to so many creatives like i mean i've i've experimented in making my own games with the full knowledge of like card games and stuff that okay well no yeah. one's gonna play these but it's just fun coming up with something and yeah for sure figuring out. and in that way too like that's i think my why i like D mm -hmm. and i and i just started playing D, &D. like um uh, a bunch of my friends play every Sunday and I could never get into it. I was turned off by it because I tried to DM when I was young and my friends yeah. were just assholes and they just wanted <laughs> to kill everything and fight each other. And, you know, it wasn't fun. And that was what I thought D and D was. Mm -hmm. I thought D and D was that. And I also thought it was ultra fucking nerd cringe, cringe crew. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't even, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I have a friend who, a recent friend who was really into D and D, and always since he was young, and he kept saying, "No, I think you'd actually really like DMing. You know, like you should give it a go. You should try it out." And uh, so I started. I came up with a little campaign for my family, and we started playing in it. And I suddenly realized what D and D was, and it was more of like a marriage of creative ideas and you know creative storytelling that merged the players with the DM. And when you look at it from that perspective, it seems really neat and inspired. It feels like, it feels like, I don't know, I don't know what the, what they call it, but there's a lot of artists who will paint this crazy painting and they'll spend all this time on it and then they'll just burn it or they'll destroy it in some way. And it'll feel, you know, that you're not getting anything from it financially, but yeah. you're just doing something to be creative and then it's gone. And there's something about that with D and D where it's like, I'm crafting this experience and we're having this experience together and it will it's more significant than a lot of other things and i'm not making anything from it and it's just a fun creative exercise that that i think will leave lasting impressions so it's like yeah it's super super cool I'm, I'm glad i finally dove dove into it and i dove in hard <laughs> yeah i mean it's yeah it can definitely if you get a good group together be yeah Oh, that's so that's that's awesome though yeah there is something about when it comes to creative work too making stuff for yourself and with i guess making stuff that you know okay well this is never get, going to get sold or this isn't i'm not making this with any intention of making any money from it yeah or whatnot. but for sure it's it's freeing especially from yeah. where i'm from where i am it's like it feels so neat to be able to do something creative and spend time on something that I could, I could be just making money. You know, mm -hmm. I could be making money and being relevant online and posting things on Twitter and getting likes and getting retweets, but spoiler alert, it's empty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most empty feeling in the world. Like nothing, no reward, no financial success, no number of retweets and likes, no response from, from fans even will ever make me feel as good as making the game does coming up with the concept executing it and seeing it seeing it li a living a living breathing thing that came out of me mm. like that's where the value is and yeah and with D, &D it's like constantly happening it's like that's all it really is is just this little weird imaginary worm that you're floating into people's brains yeah it's so cool do you when it comes to creating things do you have like uh i guess what's your creative process is it do you have like a burning desire or a burning idea that you just have to get out or is it more just coming and doing that? Sometimes as, yeah. like sometimes it'll be like, Oh, you know, I want to write about this or I want to design around this or whatever else. And, um, like eugenics has been on the back burner for so many years and it's been the project that I've been wanting to work on for so long because it says a lot of things that I haven't said before. It's unique and it's cruel in the way that life is cruel and uh I, and it's funny and it's super dark and and I, there's all these characters that i came up with that are loosely based on people that i know and and you know it's personal and and i and i really want to make it and i've, I've been 
I've been constantly feeling that urge, but I've been things have been in the way. And once Bumbo is done, I, I'm going to start working on it again, this time with Tyler. So it's it should be this should be awesome. But so sometimes yeah. something like that will happen, and I'll be like, I need to do this, and I and I do it. Um, and other other times I just come up with a concept and then let's let's prototype something that'll happen a lot too like binding of isaac was was just a prototype hmm. yeah. it's just like hey let's just do something over the weekend and see what happens prototyping is fun yeah that, that's cool how would uh i guess i what... actually have to i have to go i have a, oh, yeah. an appointment soon yes but yeah. um uh but we, we can definitely do this um another time if you want yeah i would i'd love to have you on i again i have a bunch of other questions i'd love to hit you with but yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us, or joining me, the royal us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much, man. Uh, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter, uh, kind of. I post sometimes. <laughs> uh, Edmund McMillan. That's my Twitter. That's basically Sweet. it. I mean, everything, that's my hub at this point. Like, yeah. just if you want information on me or anything I'm doing, you'll find it there. Sweet. And then I'll, I'll include links, you know, down below, I guess, if this is on YouTube or whatnot and to, uh, the blog posts and whatnot, but yeah, super excited for legend of Bum Bumbo. We'll be playing that and thanks for coming on. No problem.